Before I begin, let me just say that we have had a wonderful week in Birmingham, uh, giving the Cadbury lectures and speaking there, and we are delighted to climax and finish our trip with this event in this beautiful setting here at Highfield, and I'm looking forward to a stimulating evening with you this evening. In the award-winning movie, The Theory of Everything, Stephen Hawking introduces himself to his wife-to-be, Jane, as a cosmologist. When Jane asks what that is, he replies, it's a kind of religion for intelligent atheists. That remark is both provocative and revealing. Cosmology is obviously not literally a religion. It's a branch of astrophysics, which studies the large-scale structure of the universe. Now, if one is a naturalist, that is to say someone who believes that all that there is is space-time and its contents, then in a sense, someone who studies the universe is studying the ultimate reality. This is the same project in which the theologian is engaged except that for the theologian, the ultimate reality is God, not the universe. The theologian has a wider, more encompassing view of reality than the naturalist, since he believes in a reality that transcends the universe. The universe is a subordinate reality which is created by God. For cosmologists who are theists, for example, uh, George Ellis, who is perhaps the world's leading cosmologist, who is also featured in this film, cosmology is therefore not a kind of religion, but rather the scientific study of a subordinate reality. But for the naturalist, it's easy to see how cosmology could become quasi-religious. Now, cosmology is divided into two sub-disciplines, which once again have intriguing parallels in theology. The first sub-discipline is cosmogony, which is the study of the origin of the universe. Parallel to this is the theological locus or category or doctrine of creation particularly creatio originans, or originating creation. Christian theology holds that God created the universe from nothing uh, a finite time ago, and therefore the universe is not eternal in the past, but had a beginning. The second sub-discipline of cosmology is eschatology, which is the study of the future fate of the universe. Now those of you who are familiar with theology will recognize immediately that this term is actually borrowed from theology. For the theological locus or doctrine of the last things is called eschatology. And once again, theological eschatology is broader in its scope than physical eschatology. For while physical eschatology studies the future fate of the universe given the laws of nature and present conditions, theological eschatology also comprises broader themes such as the state of the soul after death, the resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth, and heaven and hell. Once again, we can see how the naturalistic cosmologist studying cosmogony and physical eschatology might think of himself as engaged in a sort of religious pursuit. While physical eschatology makes a brief appearance in the movie, The Theory of Everything, it is cosmogony that dominates. The film focuses on two cosmogonic theories which Stephen Hawking has defended. The first, being the standard Big Bang model based entirely on the general theory of relativity. And the second being the so-called no-boundary proposal, 
which Hawking developed in collaboration with James Hartle of the University of California, Santa Barbara, based on the incorporation of quantum physics into the standard model to yield a quantum theory of gravity. The film explores the alleged theological implications of these two theories. So that we might better understand these alleged theological implications, let me say a bit about these two approaches to cosmogony. First, the standard general relativistic model. Prior to the 1920s, scientists had always assumed that the universe as a whole was stationary and eternal. Tremors of the impending earthquake that would topple this traditional cosmology were first felt in 1917, when Albert Einstein made a cosmological application of his newly discovered gravitational theory, the general theory of relativity. To his chagrin, Einstein found that general relativity would not permit an eternal static model of the universe unless he fudged his equations to offset the gravitational effects of matter. During the 1920s, the Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman and the Belgian astronomer Georges Lemaitre, by taking Einstein's equations at face value, came up independently with models of an expanding universe. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, through tireless observations at Mount Wilson Observatory, made a startling discovery which confirmed Friedman and Lemaitre's theory. He found that the light from distant galaxies appeared to be redder than expected. This red shift in the light was most plausibly due to the stretching of the light waves as the galaxies are moving away from us. Wherever Hubble trained his telescope in the night sky, he observed this same red shift in the light from the distant galaxies. It appeared that we are at the center of a cosmic explosion and all of the other galaxies are flying away from us at fantastic speeds. Now, According to the friedman lemaitre model, we're not really at the center of the universe. Rather, an observer in any galaxy will look out and see the other galaxies moving away from him. This is because, according to the theory, it is really space itself which is expanding. The galaxies are actually at rest in space but they recede from one another as space itself expands. The friedman lemaitre model eventually came to be known as the Big Bang Theory. But that name can be misleading. Thinking of the Big Bang as a sort of explosion could mislead us into thinking that the galaxies are moving into a pre-existing empty space from a central point. That would be a complete misunderstanding of the model. The theory is much more radical than that. As you trace the expansion of space back in time, everything gets closer and closer together. Eventually, the distance between any two points in space becomes zero. You can't get any closer than that. Space and time cannot be extended further back than that. So at that point, you've reached the boundary of space and time. It is literally the beginning of space and time. To get a picture of this, we can portray our three-dimensional space as a two-dimensional disk, which shrinks as you go back in time. Eventually, the distance between any two spatial points becomes zero. So space-time can be represented geometrically as a cone. What's significant about this 
is that while a cone can be extended indefinitely in one direction, it has a boundary point in the other direction. Because this direction represents time and the boundary point lies in the past, the model implies that past time is finite and had a beginning. Because space-time is the arena in which all matter and energy exist, the beginning of space-time is also the beginning of all matter and energy. It's the beginning of the universe. Notice that there's simply nothing prior to the initial boundary of space-time. Let's not, however, be misled by words. When cosmologists say there is nothing prior to the initial boundary, they do not mean that there is something prior to it, and that is a state of nothingness. That would be to treat nothing as though it were something. Rather, they mean that at that boundary point, it is false that there is something prior to this point. The standard Big Bang model thus predicts an absolute beginning of the universe. In the movie, the standard model is described in the following exchange between Hawking and Jane. Hawking says, if Einstein is right, if general relativity is correct, then the universe is expanding, yes? Yes. So if you reverse time, the universe would get smaller. All right. So what if I reverse the process all the way back to see what happened at the beginning of time itself? The beginning of time itself? The universe getting smaller and smaller, denser and denser, hotter and hotter, as, as we wind back the clock. Keep winding. You've got to go all the way back to the beginning of time. Keep winding until you get a space-time singularity. The standard model thus predicted an initial singularity. There were, however, suspicions that since the real universe is not perfectly similar to Friedman and Lemaitre's ideal model, their prediction of a singular beginning to the universe would ultimately fail. Perhaps the distribution of matter and energy in the real universe is not homogeneous enough for the universe to shrink down to a singularity. In 1970, however, Hawking, in collaboration with Roger Penrose of Oxford University, proved that the assumption of ideal homogeneity was irrelevant. The Hawking-Penrose singularity theorems showed that so long as the universe is governed by general relativity, our past must include an initial singularity. Now, such a conclusion is profoundly disturbing for anybody who reflects on it. For the question cannot be suppressed, why did the universe come into being? Sir Arthur Eddington, contemplating the beginning of the universe, opined that the expansion of the universe was so preposterous and incredible that I feel almost an indignation that anyone should believe in it, except myself. He finally felt forced to conclude the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. In a scene deleted from the final cut of the movie, Jane and Hawking reflect on the implications of the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorem. Jane says, this is amazing. This is poetry. Well, it's black hole theory. Time began at a certain point. There was a moment of creation. Yes, this is God's work. Oh, I think you'll find the equations are mine, but good point. <laughs> the standard Big Bang model thus predicts an absolute beginning of the universe. If this model is correct, then we have amazing scientific confirmation of the theological doctrine of creation out of nothing. 
So is the standard model correct? Or more importantly, is it correct in predicting a beginning of the universe? Despite its empirical confirmation, the standard Big Bang model will need to be modified in various ways. The model is based, as I've said, on Einstein's general theory of relativity. But Einstein's theory breaks down when the universe becomes shrunk down to subatomic proportions. We'll need to introduce quantum physics at that point, and no one is sure how this is to be done. The second cosmogonic model mentioned in the film is just such an attempt to marry quantum physics to general relativity to craft a quantum theory of gravity that will enable us to describe the early universe. The so-called no boundary proposal developed by Stephen Hawking in collaboration with James Hartle, who uh, oddly enough is never mentioned in the film, is known as the Hartle-Hawking model. The Hartle-Hawking model eliminates the initial singularity by transforming the conical geometry of classical space-time into a smooth, curved geometry having no edge, so that space-time resembles a badminton shuttlecock. This is accomplished by the introduction of imaginary numbers, like the square root of negative one, for the time variable in Einstein's gravitational equations, which effectively eliminates the singularity. The laws of physics thus do not break down at any point, allowing a complete description of space-time. In his best-selling popularization of his theory, A Brief History of Time, Hawking reveals an explicitly theological concern. He concedes that on the standard model, one could legitimately identify the Big Bang singularity as the instant at which God created the universe. Indeed, he thinks that a number of attempts to avoid the Big Bang were probably motivated by a feeling that the beginning of time, and I quote, smacks of divine intervention. He sees his new model as preferable to the standard model because there would be no edge of space-time at which one would, and I quote, have to appeal to God or some new law. Hawking sees profound theological implications in the new model. He writes, the idea that space and time may form a closed surface without boundary has profound implications for the role of God in the affairs of the universe. So long as the universe had a beginning, we could suppose it had a creator. But if the universe is really completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would have neither beginning nor end. What place then for a creator? Hawking does not deny the existence of God, but he does think that his model eliminates the need for a creator of the universe. In the movie, the theological implications of the Hartle-Hawking model are raised in a conversation between Jane, Stephen, and their friend Jonathan. Jane begins, Stephen's done a U-turn. The big new idea is that the universe has no boundaries at all. No boundaries, no beginning, oh, and no God. Oh, oh I see, I, uh, I thought that um, you proved that the universe had a beginning and thus a need for a creator, my mistake. No, mine. Stephen is looking for a single theory that explains all the forces in the universe. Therefore, God must die. Oh. Why must God die? I don't see. The two great pillars of physics are quantum theory, the laws that govern the very small, particles, electrons, and so on, and general relativity. Ah, yes, Einstein. Einstein's theory, the laws that govern the very large planets and such. But quantum and relativity, don't tell me, 
They're different. They don't play remotely by the same rules. If the world were all potatoes, then easy. You could trace a precise beginning, as Stephen once did. A moment of creation. Hallelujah. God lives. But if you incorporate peas into the menu, then it all goes a little haywire. This all becomes a godless mess. Oh, dear. God is back on the endangered species list. Well, I, I expect he'll cope. As Jonathan rightly discerned, the theological implications which Hawking seeks to draw from the model are highly suspect. There is no reason at all that God could not have created a universe described by the Hartle-Hawking model. When I spoke personally with James Hartle in his office at UCSB, he saw absolutely no theological implications in the model. Indeed, by positing a finite imaginary time on a closed surface prior to the Planck time, rather than an infinite time on an open surface, such a model actually seems to support, rather than undercut, the fact that time in the universe had a beginning. Such a theory, if successful, would enable us to model the beginning of the universe without an initial singularity involving infinite density, temperature, pressure, and so on. But as physicist John Barrow of Cambridge University points out, this type of quantum universe has not always existed. It comes into being, just as the classical cosmologies could. But it does not start at a Big Bang where physical quantities are infinite. Barrow points out that such models are often described as giving a picture of creation out of nothing, the only caveat being that in this case, there is no definite point of creation. Hawking's crucial misstep is his assumption that having a beginning entails having a beginning point. Ancient Greek paradoxes about starting and stopping have long since taught us otherwise. Imagine that a cannonball has a last instant at which it is re at rest before being fired from the cannon. In such a case, there is no point at which the cannonball first begins to move. For at any point after its final instant of rest, there will be a prior instant at which it was already in motion, ad infinitum. Yet no one would say that the cannonball does not have a finite trajectory and a cause of its motion. So having a beginning does not imply having a beginning point. Time begins to exist just in case for any finite temporal interval you choose, there are only a finite number of equal temporal intervals earlier than it. That condition is fulfilled for the Hartle-Hawking model as well as for the standard model. Moreover, it's far from clear that on any realistic interpretation of the Hartle-Hawking model, it does not in fact have a beginning point. By using the mathematical artifice of imaginary time, Hawking is able to re-describe the universe in such a way that it has no initial singularity. Hawking admits, only if we could picture the universe in terms of imaginary time would there be no singularities. When one goes back to the real time in which we live, however, there will still appear to be singularities. Hawking's model is thus a way of re-describing a universe with a singular beginning point in such a way that the singularity is transformed away. But it is the same universe with a beginning that is being described. Thus, quantum gravity models, like the standard model, imply the beginning of the universe. In his later book, The Grand Design, co-authored with Leonard Mladenov, Hawking himself seems to endorse this interpretation of the model. 
The authors write, suppose the beginning of the universe was like the South Pole of the Earth, with degrees of latitude playing the role of time. As one moves north, the circles of constant latitude representing the size of the universe would expand. The universe would start as a point at the South Pole, but the South Pole is much like any other point. To ask what happened before the beginning of the universe would become a meaningless question because there is nothing south of the South Pole. In this picture, space-time has no boundary. The same laws of nature hold at the South Pole as at other places. This passage is fascinating because it represents a rather different interpretation of the model than what we had in A Brief History of Time. Let me explain. In his model, Hawking employs imaginary numbers, like the square root of negative one, for the time variable in his equations in order to get rid of the initial cosmological singularity, which is the boundary of space-time in the standard model. The initial segment of space-time, instead of terminating in a point like a cone, is rounded off like a badminton shuttlecock. The south pole of this rounded off surface is like any other point on that surface, and hence the idea that there is no boundary or edge. Since imaginary time behaves like a dimension of space, Hawking interpreted his no boundary universe to just be. But in the grand design, the south pole is interpreted to represent the beginning point to both time and the universe. Hawking allows the circles of latitude to play the role of time, which has a beginning point at the South Pole. When Hawking speaks of the problem of time having a beginning, what he means is the age-old objection to the universe having a beginning, an objection which his model removes. So, what is that age-old objection? The objection, he says, is the question, what happened before the beginning of the universe? Hawking is right that this question is meaningless on his model. But what he fails to mention is that the question is also meaningless on the standard Big Bang model, since there is nothing prior to the initial cosmological singularity. On either model, the universe has an absolute temporal beginning so that it is meaningless to ask what happened before. Rather, the real question is, why did the universe begin to exist? The Hartle-Hawking model doesn't address that question. How could it? Physics only begins at the South Pole in the no-boundary model. There is no physics of non-being. Moreover, there isn't anything in the model that implies that that point came to be without a cause. Indeed, the idea that being could arise without a cause from non-being seems to be metaphysically absurd. Thus, both the standard model and the Hartle-Hawking quantum gravity model are united in predicting the finitude of the past and the beginning of the universe. And Hawking's inferences about the theological implications of the model are based on philosophical mistakes. It's sad that so gifted a scientist could have been let, misled by such philosophical missteps. Both models are thus perfectly in accord with the Judeo-Christian doctrine of creation out of nothing. I mentioned that physical eschatology makes scant appearance in the film The Theory of Everything. It comes only in the poignant, penultimate scene of the movie. Hawking is asked, you have said that you do not believe in God. Do you have a philosophy of life that helps you? He answers by appealing to the religion of cosmology. 
He says, it is clear that we are just an advanced breed of primates on a minor planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. But ever since the dawn of civilization, people have craved for an understanding of the underlying order of the world. There ought to be something very special about the boundary conditions of the universe, and what can be more special than that there is no boundary? And there should be no boundary to human endeavor. We are all different. However bad life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. While there is life, there is hope. Yes, applause for this remarkable man's courage and perseverance in the face of almost impossible obstacles. But even if it were true that while there is life, there is hope, the lesson of physical eschatology is that absent God, there will someday be no life, and hence no hope. Already in the 19th century, scientists realized that the application of the second law of thermodynamics to the universe as a whole implied a grim eschatological conclusion. Given sufficient time, the universe will eventually suffer heat death. Yale University astronomer Beatrice Tinsley described the fate of an expanding universe. If the universe has a low density, its death will be cold. It will expand forever at a slower and slower rate. Galaxies will turn all of their gas into stars, and the stars will burn out. Our own sun will become a cold, dead remnant floating among the corpses of other stars in an increasingly isolated Milky Way. Elementary particle physics suggests that thereafter, protons will decay into electrons and positrons so that space will be filled with a rarefied gas so thin that the distance between an electron and a positron will be about the size of the present galaxy. Eventually, all black holes will completely evaporate and all the matter in the ever-expanding universe will be reduced to a thin gas of elementary particles and radiation. There is no hope for a reversal of this descent into oblivion. The universe will inevitably become increasingly cold, dark, dilute, and dead. Reflection on this eschatological conclusion has led some philosophers to question the meaning of life itself. In a famous passage, the British philosopher Bertrand Russell lamented that man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Russell's keen philosophical mind saw more clearly than Hawking the correct implications of a godless universe. Russell, however, was unaware of the evidence for a beginning of the universe and thus of the need for a cosmic creator. When asked to explain the existence of the universe, Russell replied, the universe is just there and that's all. This response is understandable on a pre-Einsteinian view of the universe, but it becomes inept 
when confronted with the fact of the universe's temporal beginning. Such a beginning points beyond the universe to its ground in a transcendent creator. If such a creator does exist, then he offers the best hope of deliverance from the somber implications of physical eschatology. Well, that was uh, an engagement of mind and emotion at a very deep level with very profound questions. And so let's use this opportunity of having Bill here to tease him out further with your particular questions. Now, don't be uh, afraid that your question might be a, a silly question. Uh, Bill will very, adapt readily to the sort of varieties of questions that he gets and uh, he'll be very happy to... If, if you've got a question to ask, you can be fairly sure that somebody here will have an interest in the answer to your question, who will be thinking the question that you're thinking. So I wonder if you'd like to um, join Timothy, who is guarding the microphone, and um, set us off with some questions to tease these issues out further for the next little while. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, that was all I expected it to be. Um, would you please discuss the possibility that instead of a big bang, it was a big bounce, and that it was, it's the result of, a, of the collapse of a previous universe mm -hmm. and then uh, into what we now see as a big bang? And were that to be true, what would be the theological implications of it? Let me say that this evening's lecture, because it was motivated by the film, is restricted to the discussion of just the standard model and the hartle hawking model. But obviously, there are many other proposed models of the universe, and the so-called oscillating model, uh, or models, as there are many, is one such that you've described. These models were floated in the early uh, 1970s and late 60s, particularly by Russian cosmologists, and they were an attempt to say that when the universe expanded to a certain point, the gravitational effect of matter would overcome the force of the expansion and everything would suck back together again in a tremendous big crunch. And if the matter did not coalesce directly to a point, the matter could slingshot past itself so that it would re-expand to a new expansion. Uh, and the hypothesis was maybe this goes on eternally, like an accordion. Well, these models did not outlive the 1970s, in particular, the Hartle-Hawking singularity theorems that we've just been discussing were really fatal for this kind of model because it showed that such a model, if it did re-collapse, would collapse back to a singularity and it is impossible for space and time to be extended through a singularity to another expansion. So on a collapsing model, the universe would simply expand, recollapse, and end at a terminal singularity. In addition to that, scientists discovered that the density of the universe wasn't sufficient to generate the gravitational attraction sufficient to slow the expansion, halt it, and recontract the universe. Instead, all the evidence indicated the universe would expand forever. And in the most recent um, investigations, it turns out that the expansion unexpectedly is actually accelerating. There is a kind of uh, dark energy that propels the expansion even more rapidly so that the prospect of recontraction is uh, effectively ruled out. So these oscillating models are not really widely discussed anymore. Um, good evening. I'd like to try and equate how you feel about the time taken for the universe to develop and the time period uh, stated in, in Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, I've just re re read a book by Professor Andrew Parker um, who wrote a book called Genesis Enigma, 
and he tries to explain the difference between the two or mm -hmm. equate the two. How do you explain it? It's striking when you read the first chapter of Genesis that the opening verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is a cosmic description or perspective. Ancient Hebrew did not have a word for the universe. When the ancient Hebrew wanted to say something about everything there is, he would use the idiom, the heavens and the earth. So the first verse says, in effect, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then with verse two, the focus dramatically narrows to this planet. And the earth was without form and void. And the remainder of the chapter describes how God transforms the earth into a habitable place for humankind. And so I would see the origin of the universe described by Big Bang cosmology as consonant with verse one of Genesis one. And then what happens from verse two and following is not part of cosmology, that's part of earth science or earth history. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, surely if time is like a point with a moment before and a moment after, then um, a Christian couldn't believe in the model of the, cre of the beginning of the universe, because the beginning of the universe talks about the beginning of time. But if God made a decision at a point to create the universe, then there must have been a moment before and a moment after this decision, so surely God must have existed within time, and so he cannot have created time yeah. after that. Why well, think that a decision has to be taken after a period of indecision. Um, since God is omniscient, he knows the future, he knows everything he's going to do. So I think that God's being indecision, uh, in, a, in a state of indecision is ruled out by his omniscience, not just his timelessness. So I would take it the decision to create a universe is an eternal decision that God makes. He exists timelessly with the intention of creating a universe with a beginning. And I see no reason to think that the idea of an eternal decision, that is to say an eternal intention, a free intention of the mind, is incoherent and that you have to have a period of indecision existing before. Did that make sense? That's brilliant, thanks. Okay. <laughs> why there is such a big um, kind of conflict between people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God over the theories that Hawkins and other cosmologists come up with. Because to me, what we seem to be discussing is not the evolution of the, the, uh, of the universe in itself, but why did it happen? Yeah. And is it, you know, the, the, the things that they're finding out still fit quite happily if you interpret days to be millennia. Oh. Uh, so why, why is it that we have the big discussion of are they right or wrong as opposed to... Well, obviously, we're not having that discussion, are we, here this evening, right? That's not the topic this evening. So I think the reason that people, some people feel exercised to discuss this is they want to know what is the correct interpretation of the opening chapter of the Bible. Is it to be construed literally as describing six 24-hour consecutive days? Or are these days metaphors for long periods of time, as you suggest? And uh, I personally think that the opening chapter of Genesis is open to a wide range of interpretations that are available for the biblically faithful Christian. And so, I'm not all worked up about this issue, and that's why it's not on the table tonight. But I guess my question really is, is why has the media latched onto this as being something to almost prove the non-existence of, of God to make it easier for people who do not believe in so God? So do you think that the media tries to ridicule Christians because of six-day creationism? No, I, I believe that they, they can use it as a way to make it easier to not believe. I don't right. Think it's well, maybe, maybe you've just answered your own question. I mean, there are forces of secular culture that are bent on doing anything they can to make the Christian faith look 
silly to undermine it as much as they can, to make it look anti-intellectual, to make Christians look stupid. And if they can do this by painting us all as young earth creationists, they, they certainly will do so. Um, so one shouldn't have any illusion about the neutrality of certain media outlets or, or reports that one receives. There, there, I think there are forces arrayed against a Christian world and life view that are deeply secular or even atheistic and, and are bent on making Christians look bad. Um, it's sort of a wonder. If we're taking the typical picture, theistic picture of God's timelessness, sort of the Bohemian image, if both the models you were describing are acting within time, and we want to see God as timeless, surely it doesn't really matter which one we go for, as if God is outside of time, he could have created the universe or created creation either way, regardless of the model. So surely in that sense it doesn't really matter which one we go for. Now, what are the alternatives that it doesn't matter which one we go well, for? Well, if, if we're acting under sort of the standard Big Bang model or the Hawking model, they're both acting under, well, they're dependent upon time. And if God is timeless, surely he could create, it doesn't really matter. Well, exactly. And that was what I was arguing this evening, is that b these models are comparable in their theological implications because they both involve a finite past, an absolute beginning of the universe, and I think that is fully in accord, as you say, with the existence of a God who transcends time and space and brings space-time into existence by an act of his omnipotent power. So theologically, you'd say it doesn't really matter which one of the two pictures we go for because... Right. Theologically, I don't think it does matter. Both of them, I think, have the same theological implications, so far as I can see. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Hi, my name is CJ. I just want to ask you a question. Um, is it, don't you think that, for example, the atheist idea like naturalism and materialism is a more reasonable idea than theology in the sense that with naturalists, they deal with, um, with ultimate reality. So they think that things are finite and they have to believe in things that are just in the universe. They can't believe in something beyond it because they really have no evidence for it. I mean, if you're going to go with the idea that, you know, God made, made the universe, then that's, you might want to believe that, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's true because then you have, to, you have to argue with what God and how do you know that that is the God that made the universe rather than wouldn't you go with things that you do know and wait for, wait for when there's more evidence to know that there is actually a God that caused the universe to exist. Uh -huh. And also um, to do with the Bible. When well, you said, perhaps so, we could... Oh, oh, just one this question. Way. Way. Um, <laughs> it's been rightly said that British and Americans are two people separated by a common language. Uh, and just as I speak with an American accent, I have difficulty understanding your accent. That's fine. So I'm gonna ask Peter May to help me interpret <laughs> what Perfect. you just said Perfect. so that I can answer it, if, if I may. Can you try and express your question in a, a sim simple sentence? So you didn't understand did it either. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did have great difficulty getting hold of that. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> I, um, basically, my argument is based on like the God of the gaps argument, where we can't. God where, of the gaps argument. Yeah, so mm. that's where I, that's the just generalize the generalization of my argument. It's very important to see that tonight I haven't argued for a God of the gaps in any way. There's nothing I've said in this evening's lecture that says here is a gap in scientific knowledge. Therefore, let's appeal to God to explain it. Um, quite the contrary. What I've said is that the findings of physical cosmogony are consonant or in accord with the doctrine that theology has of creatio ex nihilo, of creation out of nothing. I've said that the conclusions of theology fit with what contemporary science is telling us about the origin of the universe. Now, insofar as one might argue for the creator of the universe, the scientific evidence that one has adduced here is not evidence for God. It's evidence for the fact that the universe began to exist. And you see, that's a, a religiously neutral statement that can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics, that the universe began to exist. 
It will only be in the context of a wider philosophical argument that theological conclusions, I think, then will follow. But there isn't any use of science here in an illicit way to prove or, or show God. I think what science does is it helps to establish that religiously neutral statement that the universe began to exist. Maybe you didn't understand my answer <laughs> better than I did your question. <laughs> okay. Sorry, um, a, bit of, <coughs> sorry, a bit of a philosophical question, I suppose. Um, I say, if something caused everything, then that implies that something caused itself, which is ah. paradoxical. Therefore, the opposite must be true. Everything must come from nothing. If this argument is valid, do we need God the Creator? You should have been in Birmingham this week to hear my <laughs> Cadbury lectures. My topic was how God is the sole ultimate reality, the creator of everything other than himself. So that is the faulty premise in your argument, is that there is something that is the creator of everything. No, the correct statement would be that God is the creator of everything other than himself. But God himself is uncreated. He is a, what theologians call a self-existent being. This is the property called aseity, uh, the property of being independent of everything else, of being self-existent. And so the argument is based upon a false premise. Um, and when it's properly stated, then there is no uh, incoherence. Hi, my question follows on from that one, actually. Um, philosophy of religion textbooks, in this country anyway, suggest that Bertrand Russell, when asked about the origins of the universe, saw it as a brute given. It was necessary. It just was. And what the textbooks often then say is, why is the universe not any more necessary than a necessary mm -hmm. being called God? Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, this is... A wonderful question. I don't think that those textbooks accurately represent Russell's view. When he says the universe is just there and that's all, he didn't mean that the universe exists necessarily. What he meant is that the universe is just a brute fact. It's just an unexplained given. There is no explanation for why the universe exists rather than nothing. He didn't think that the universe was necessary in its existence. And I think with good reason. To mention just one point, what we've been talking about this evening, a necessary being is a being which cannot fail to exist. Its non-existence is impossible. And so, as my doctoral mentor, John Hick, showed, a necessary being must have the essential properties of being eternal, uncaused, indestructible, and incorruptible. Now, if the universe began to exist, it follows that the universe does not have the property of being eternal. And therefore, it cannot be a necessary being. It is contingent, and indeed contingent in a radical way. It came into existence. And that surely cries out for an explanation. I can give Russell a run for his money when he says that the existence of an eternal universe is just a brute, unexplained fact. I, I don't believe that, but I, I can understand that attitude. But if the universe came into existence about 14 billion years ago, that sort of reply, I think, is just inept because it shows that the universe is contingent in a very radical way um, that points to a transcendent cause that brought it into existence. Thank you. If you're interested in following up on this issue, in my book, On Guard, there's a nice discussion of this argument in the chapter about Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and his argument for God's existence, which was a sort of argument from contingency to God as a necessary being. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. I actually had one question, but with uh, your answer right now, I have another question too, if uh, I could say. Now, uh, well, uh, the one uh, regarding the necessary being, there's also this argument that the necessary being should be unique. 
that there can only be one necessary being, because in the sense that there is two necessary beings, then there's a continuous sort of condition that makes them, set them apart, so we can only have one. Then how would you place Trinity into, into that uh, context? Uh, I would agree with you that there's nothing about the attribute of necessity that implies uniqueness. In fact, many mathematicians think that numbers are necessary being. And so there's an infinite number of them. There are all the natural numbers, for example, plus all the other mathematical objects. Now, I myself don't believe that, but I don't think that you can simply deduce from the concept of something's being necessary that there's only one of it. I think you'd need some sort of independent reason for that. Uh, in the sense that it is the first cause, uh, the cause of causes, so uh, it should be one cause. Uh, so the necessary being needs to be unique in that sense. So being uniqueness, uh, if we have like the Trinity and, or two or three necessary beings at the same time. Well, no, did you say the Trinity? Uh, 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 that, that's, those aren't three beings. Hmm. God, God is three persons, but it's one being, one substance. So there's only one God. Christianity is, is monotheism, yes. not polytheism. But let me address your question. If I were offering an argument for an uncaused first cause, I would appeal to Occam's razor to justify uniqueness. Occam's razor is an explanatory principle that says you are only justified in positing those causes that are necessary to explain the effect. Do not postulate causes beyond necessity. And one first uncaused cause is sufficient to explain the effect so that the postulation of further causes would be unjustified and will get shaved away by Occam's razor. Uh, the question regarding time, if... Uh, okay, we've got quite a crowd. Uh, sure, okay. I, okay, I, I, thank okay. you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I have read that if you, um, an article that suggested that if you look at all the measurements of the speed of light, that it appears to have been decreasing through time. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, I didn't quite catch that, Peter, did you? The speed of light is decreasing oh. in time. This is an attempt by certain young Earth creationists to try to justify the view that the um, world is actually much, much younger than it appears to be. When you look at the stars, you see objects, galaxies, that are billions of light years away. So if the light came to us from those stars, it would imply the universe is billions of years old, right? So what they say is, no, the speed of light is uh, slowing down. It was faster in the past, and so the light could get here very quickly. From what I've read, however, um, this is based upon cherry-picking uh, the scientific evidence to make it look like the speed of light is slowing down. In fact, when you look at the various measurements of the speed of light over the decades, they pretty much average out to the same constant velocity. If you're interested in this subject, take a look at the website of Hugh Ross and his ministry, Reasons to Believe. Hugh Ross is an ex-astrophysicist who's now engaged in a sort of science ministry, religion and science, reasons to believe, and he is very much in conversation with young Earth creationists and their various arguments, and he has literature that addresses the question of the slowing down of the speed of light. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, um, really enjoyed it. Good. Um, I think that uh, one of the issues that affects me when I hear about scientific explanations of any kind, including cosmology, and trying to relate it to the being of God and how we came to our existence, um, I'd like to think about our interpretation of Genesis and the Bible, not in a straightforward, literal sense, mm -hmm but looking at it from a literary point of view. And when you look at Genesis 1, um, day 4, the sun, the moon, and the stars are created after the earth. And so we get something which obviously is out of sync yes. with how science understands the beginning of our world. So when we come to think in cosmological terms about um, those two models that you gave 
and saying that, that there is a beginning on both a beginning of time on both those models, and therefore they're not inconsistent with an idea of a transcendent creator God creating the universe. That's fine as far as we can go, but we don't learn very much about God himself in that sort of way of thinking. So we need something else. If we then go to the Bible as the source documents of the Christian faith, and we look at Genesis, we look at the Gospels, and we see, for example, both Jesus, well, in the Gospels, Jesus speaks about the creation story as if it had happened, that Adam and Eve really existed. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Paul in Romans will talk about Adam as a, a certain historical being. One could say that's just for theological argument, but it seems to me that he's saying this as though Adam were a, a real historical being. Um, what are we to do with trying to get an understanding of where we came from, both from the Bible, which seems to suggest that the Genesis story is uh, something which is supposedly true, mm -hmm. and then cosmogony and other yes. sort of uh, cosmological theories and other scientific theories seem to suggest something else. How do we match this all up, from your point of view, in order to get a really coherent view yes. of where we came from and where we're going? Well, what you've asked is an enormous question. You think so? <laughs> um, and so what I want to do is to refer you to my online resources about this. I teach an adult class at our church called Defenders, in which we do a systematic survey of uh, the various areas of theology and their interaction with contemporary thought, philosophy, science, and history. And we have a section called Doctrine of Creation, and there is a subsection on that called An Excursus on Creation and Evolution. And I would invite you to look at that on our website, reasonablefaith.org, and there are, are several weeks' worth of lectures on this where I lay out, I think, seven or eight different interpretations of Genesis 1 that biblical Christians have offered. There is a wide, wide diversity of interpretations. And then I offer some assessment of these as to their strengths and weaknesses. And then when we get to the question of uh, Adam, we also explore the historicity of Adam and Eve, whether these are historical persons, and the challenge to that that issues from population genetics today, which uh, many claim do not allow the human race to ever get below about 2,000 individuals. So these, these are huge issues that you're raising, and I would simply invite you, if you're really interested Go to reasonablefaith.org, click on the section called Defenders, and you'll find there either um, videos of the lessons that you can watch and listen to, or if you're in a greater hurry, there are transcripts of the lessons all written out that you can read. And I, I think you'll find there a very responsible, balanced, and informed treatment of these questions that you're raising. Well, learn something new every day. <laughs> Hello. On Friday, there was a total solar eclipse of the sun in the North Atlantic. Um, here in Britain, because of our weather, you could sort of barely notice it. <laughs> but thousands of years ago, there was no explanation for this except to invoke supernatural powers. Mm -hmm. But as our civilization, civilization has continued, we've learned more and more, we've discovered more science. We have found explanations for more and more of what happens. So we have identified this point in modern physics, the, the Big Bang, the origin of time, and we don't have an explanation for why that happened, when and there. <clears throat> but our, our knowledge of cosmology, of physics in that area, is very rudimentary. We don't understand dark matter. We don't understand dark energy. And so you're jumping to the conclusion that there must be a supernatural reason it seems to be based on the assumption that there's no more to learn. But as time goes on, we will learn more about this, and we may have a very plausible answer. Now, you're, do you understand that what you're posing is just the old God of the gaps objection that I've already addressed? No, I don't think he addressed it. 
But, but you do understand that that's the objection, don't you? That this is just God of the gaps accusation. That I'm appealing to God or supernatural entity to plug up the gaps in our scientific knowledge. But are you assuming there will be no, no new knowledge that Not at all. explains that? Not at all. All I'm claiming is that the best evidence of contemporary cosmology supports that religiously neutral statement, the universe began to exist. And there's no God of the gaps involved in that at all. If the evidence should suggest that the universe didn't begin to exist, well and good. But uh, so far as I know, uh, the evidence uh, lines up very, very strongly in support of that statement, which is a scientific statement, not a theological one. And so why do you resist the evidence of modern science and refuse to follow the evidence where it leads? Well, it's not positive evidence, it's negative evidence. It's oh. evidence of the gap. No, no, but it's why not the negative. Uh, the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorems, the gord guth vilenkin singularity theorem, uh, the, the red shift, the microwave background radiation, this is all positive evidence that the universe is not past eternal. In fact, Alex Vilenkin, uh, who is a very prominent Russian-American cosmologist from Tufts University, gave a talk at the 70th um, birthday celebration of Stephen Hawking in Cambridge two years ago, in which he surveyed the models of contemporary cosmology and Vilenkin's conclusion was that none of these can be past eternal. He said, all the evidence we have says that the universe began to exist. That's a direct quote. And I was struck by that statement because it would be significant if he said, um, the evidence for a beginning outweighs the evidence against a beginning. But he didn't say that. He said, all the evidence we have says that the universe began to exist. There isn't anything on the other side of the scale. So why not follow the evidence where it leads? You have not mentioned the multi-universe. No, I haven't tonight, but that's Does only because- Each one have their own God? That's only because I was responding to the film, The Theory of Everything, and contrasting these two models, uh, the hartle hawking model and the standard model. But in my published work, uh, of course I address multiverse models and multiverse scenarios. I, um, so I would refer you again to my published work on this where these issues are thoroughly discussed. Particularly um, the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, which is published by Wiley Blackwell in Oxford. I have an article in there with the physicist Jim Sinclair in which we discuss these sorts of models and whether or not they can be past eternal. So if you're interested in following it up, take a look at the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology and the article that I've co-authored there with Sinclair. Okay, thank, you. thank you for your question. Hi, we, we kind of started out by considering cosmology as a religion. And maybe we need to widen that to all of science. And I, I reflect that it's actually quite a good religion in that um, it has good, um, it, it provides an explanation of what we see around us and all those sorts of things mm -hmm. that a religion does. I, I wonder if you could um, just reflect with us where you think it particularly falls down as a religion, because quite a few religions don't have a God. Yeah. Not all religions promise eternal life and so on. But, right. Um, well, so as I said, bad for... The naturalist, I can understand how it would be a sort of quasi-religion. That was the opening part of my talk tonight. Um, but I'm not a naturalist, so in that sense, I, I think it's an inadequate religion. It doesn't really have a hold of the ultimate reality. But even when assessed on its own terms, I guess here's what I would say, is that it lacks any explanation of why the universe exists rather than nothing. And I think that its eschatology puts a question mark behind the meaning of human life and existence in the way that Bertrand Russell did, so that it ultimately leads to despair uh, and meaninglessness and absurdity. 
Um, so I guess I would see those as fundamental failings of the religion of cosmology. Good evening. Good evening. I'd, I'd like to pick up a bit on the Bertram Russell quotation, um, but in the context of the whole uh, um, of your talk up to that point um, was about current scientific um, theories and knowledge that yes. um, support the need or the existence of a creator. Um, then Stephen Hawkins had this um, question put to him where he ended up saying, but whilst there's life, there's hope, yes. basically. Um, now, I just wondered what your opinion was, because to me, there is a fundamental difference between the being a being, if you see what I mean, um, the, that created the universe, and there being a God who cares about human beings. Of course. And, and, and it seemed to me that Stephen Hawkins was going from a scientific statement to a humanist statement. And are we not sometimes, um, at being Christians, uh, um, tempted to assume that a creator God would also be one that cared about human beings? I don't know if we're guilty of assuming that. Certainly those of us who are Christian philosophers will not make that sort of leap. Um, what I've talked about tonight would be common property to Christians, Jews, Muslims, even deists who don't believe that God has revealed himself in any way. If you were to ask me, why are you a Christian theist then I would shift gears and I would begin to talk about the person of Jesus of Nazareth and who he was, who he claimed to be, and the credibility of his resurrection from the dead, which as Peter said was the work of my doctoral um, thesis at the University of Munich. And it would be on the basis of who you think Jesus of Nazareth was or is that will form, I think, the crucial transition to a Christian theism rather than just a, a generic theism. And I haven't talked about that tonight, but again, in my, in my work like On Guard, or Reasonable Faith, that work that I did at the University of Munich comes into play in trying to move beyond mere theism to Christian theism. Okay, well, so I'm still not quite clear about <clears throat> your purpose in choosing the quotation from Bertrand Russell, ah. which seemed to, um, in the face of Stephen Hawkins' humanistic statement, you seem to give this, this hopeless view, yes. which to me um, doesn't preclude God as creator, but does preclude God as... Christians understand right. you're, Well, you're absolutely right. You see, what I was trying to do there was saying that Hawking's statement, while there is life, there is hope, it, it sounds very optimistic and cheery, but I think, honestly, it's sort of like whistling in the graveyard. I, I think Russell, also an atheist like Hawking, a keen philosophical thinker, saw more accurately the implications of atheism and particularly of physical eschatology on an atheist worldview. So that was the point that I was trying to make, was that Hawking's optimistic view, I think, sits very ill, very uncomfortably, with naturalistic, atheistic cosmology, and that here Russell saw more courageously the real and hopeless implications of atheism and physical eschatology without God. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It is now eight o'clock, and I think we um, have to, I see several people still standing. Let's take one more question, and then we'll stop, and hopefully you'll keep your questions and take them across to the hall afterwards and ask Bill in a more informal way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question relates to the motivations that scientists have for their research. So do you think scientists like uh, Stephen Hawking 
and indeed Christian scientists, not necessarily just atheist, atheist scientists, do themselves a disservice by going out to, to try and prove a point that God is necessary or unnecessary? Or do you think they should do the science just to try and find more about the universe which we live in and then afterwards discuss its implications? Okay, now if I understood correctly, was the question, do I think that scientists are doing a disservice to us by going beyond their science and beginning to draw theological implications from their work? Yeah. No, I don't, not at all. What I think they do as a disservice is, is not studying some philosophy <laughs> before they do it. But I, I envy them their physical expertise in cosmology and, and astrophysics. I think it's wonderful and I want to hear from them. But many of these men have a disdainful attitude toward philosophy. Uh, in the great, uh, the grand design, with, co-authored with Leonard Mladenov, on the first page, they declare that philosophy is dead and thereby have insulted all of their colleagues at Cambridge University in the philosophy department by saying this discipline doesn't deserve to exist. And I think that's just enormously naive. The, the, the first third of the book then goes on to discuss the philosophical question of realism versus anti-realism in science. So yes, I value their input, I want their input, but they need to exert the same effort to understand philosophy that I as a philosopher have exerted in trying to honestly understand physical cosmology. Do you think that Stephen Hawking... Um, do, you think that he could have been more uh, productive as a scientist if he hadn't have been so obsessed with trying to prove that God wasn't necessary, but... but oh, I, I would never say something like that because I can't speak to his personal motivations. Um, uh, I, I, that would be inappropriate, and I'm not a psychologist or psychoanalyst. Um, so I, I, he does say that some other attempts to avoid the Big Bang were motivated by anti-theological motives, and Fred Hoyle was very candid about that and his own motivations. But with respect to Hawking, no, I, I wouldn't say that and uh, wouldn't presume to judge in that way. Bill, thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you, I've enjoyed it very much, thank you. And thank you all for coming, and particularly for those who've asked questions. We've had some very good questions tonight. And I've got a deep conviction that in our world, dialogue is absolutely essential to try and understand each other's viewpoints and to weigh and consider. We, the church for far too long has spoken from pulpits, six foot above contradiction, and hasn't heard what people are saying and thinking. Um, Bill is wonderful at engaging with the issues that are being expressed and considered by many people in the world. So thank you again, Bill.